An 89-year-old man sits in a prison jumper on his wheelchair. His hair has long since grayed and fallen out in large patches. And yet, despite appearances, this old man was once one of America's most feared crime lords. Waiting to be transferred between prisons for his next trial, the old man is sitting in his prison cell when suddenly two large men slip inside. They proceed to beat the man mercilessly. Then they wrap him in his blanket and lay him in his bed. Within the hour, the old man is found by prison staff, though he has long since been dead. So ends the life of Whitey Bulger, Boston's most notorious crime lord. Whitey Bulger, legally known as James Joseph Bulger Jr., was born in 1929 to a Canadian immigrant and his Irish wife. Bulger's father worked as a union laborer in the Boston area and occasionally as a longshoreman or a dock worker in Boston's harbor. Earning a decent living, the entire family was nevertheless cast into destitution when Bulger's father had his arm mangled in an industrial accident. The family would end up moving to a housing project in South Boston in 1938 where Bulger would grow up alongside two brothers, William Michael and John P. Bulger. Yet while William and John both excelled at school, Bulger was drawn into the street life and soon he developed a reputation as a thief and a street fighter. Local police nicknamed Bulger Whitey because of his very blonde hair, but Bulger hated the name and preferred to be called Jim, Jimmy, or Boots due to his habit of wearing cowboy boots and his fondness of hiding a switchblade inside them. Like so often happens though, the name Whitey stuck, which admittedly sounds more nefarious than being known as Boots. In 1943, Bulger was part of an Irish street gang known as the Shamrocks, though his criminal activities would lead to his first arrest and sentencing to a juvenile reformatory. After being released in 1948, Bulger did as so many other poor kids with no options do and enlisted in the US military, joining the US Air Force. Throughout his enlistment though, he spent time in military prison for assaults and was even arrested by Air Force police for going absent without leave in 1950. Surprisingly, he managed to finish his four-year contract though and in 1952 earned an honorable discharge and returned back home to Massachusetts. In 1956 though, Bulger was arrested for armed robbery and truck hijacking, earning his first sting in federal prison at the Atlanta Penitentiary in Georgia. As a way to shorten his prison sentence, Bulger volunteered for what he thought was a program using experimental drugs to help find a cure for schizophrenia. Though unfortunately for him, he was actually volunteering to join secret testing of the CIA's MK Ultra program. Fearful of communist forces overseas using drugs and other means to control the minds of US service members, the CIA had decided it needed to beat the communists to the punch and therefore had launched MK Ultra as a means of discovering if there were any ways to influence or control unwitting subjects' minds. For 18 months, Bulger and 18 other inmates were given a steady diet of LSD and other mind-affecting drugs. And while that may sound like a far better way to spend time in prison, maybe even enjoyable, Bulger would go on to describe the experience as a nightmarish hell on earth. His own journal showed that Bulger was terrified by the visions the drugs caused and that he routinely heard voices but feared that if he told anyone, then he would be committed. In November of 1962, Bulger would finally be transferred to Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary and then a year later to Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary until his third parole plea was granted in 1965. In total, Bulger would serve nine years in prison and he would not be arrested again for another 46 years. After his release, Bulger attempted to go straight, working as a janitor and construction worker, but ended up being lured back into the easy life of crime, becoming a bookmaker and loan shark working under the mobster Donald Colleen. Colleen was a central South Boston crime figure whose gang named the Colleens, no points for style there, had ruled South Boston's criminal underground for over 20 years. During his time with the Colleens, Bulger was caught up in the infamous Colleen Mullen War. When Colleen's younger brother Kenny shot and mauled Michael Dwyer, a member of the rival Mullen gang, the war would lead to dozens of killings throughout Boston and its suburbs, and it was during this war that Bulger drew his first blood. Setting out to kill Mullen gang member Paul McGonigal, Bulger instead mistakenly shot McGonagall's law-abiding brother Donald square between the eyes. As Bulger realized he was on the wrong side of a losing war, he secretly approached Howie Winter, leader of the Winter Hill Gang. Seriously, what's with these names? Bulger told Winter that he could end the gang war by murdering the leaders of the Colleens, and shortly after, Donald Colleen was gunned down outside of his home. Some dispute that this ever happened though, and that Donald was murdered by Mullen enforcers instead. Whatever the case, 
Bulger and the surviving Killeens fled Boston, fearing for their lives. The Killeens petitioned for Winter and Patriarch of Capo Regime Joseph Russo to mediate a ceasefire between the two gangs. Bulger represented the Killeens, and the two gangs ended up joining forces under Winter as overall boss. With the truce in place in 1972, Bulger shared control of South Boston's criminal underworld with the Mullins. Bulger then began shaking down bookmakers and loan sharks, and in order to remove opposition, he petitioned Winter to sanction the murder of anyone who stepped out of line. Bulger used this sanctioned killing to remove all would-be competition from South Boston. In 1979, though, Lady Luck would smile once more on Bulger, as Winter and his inner circle were arrested on charges of fixing horse races. Stepping into the power vacuum alongside his top lieutenant, Stephen Fleming, Bulger took over leadership of the gang and transferred its headquarters to the Lancaster Street Garage near the Boston Garden in the West End. Flemmy, however, had been an FBI informant since 1965, and in 1971 the FBI had approached Bulger and attempted to recruit him as well, though they failed to earn his trust. Eventually, though, Bulger followed in Flemmy's footsteps and became an informant, and though the exact circumstances remain unclear, it's believed he did so in exchange for aid from the FBI against Patriarca, a powerful Italian mafia with whom Bulger had an ongoing feud. According to FBI agent John Connolly, when told that the FBI would help in his feud, Bulger responded by saying, all right, if they want to play checkers, we'll play chess, fuck them. Other sources, however, claim that Bulger was in effect blackmailed into becoming an informant by the FBI, who threatened to send him back to prison if he didn't cooperate. The Mafia story was merely a cover meant to explain Bulger and Fleming's status as informants. Whatever the case, Bulger and Fleming used their status as informants to remove competition, ratting out other criminal figures who would be conveniently pinched and jailed. Inner threats were also removed this way, and any gang member who threatened Bulger's status as boss would quickly find himself locked up in prison. Bulger's main targets, though, were the Italian Patriarca family, and in 1986, indictments against its prominent leaders left the Patriarca operation in Boston in complete shambles. Bulger was all too happy to step in and fill the void. So while the FBI had gotten rid of a major criminal threat, it had merely facilitated the creation of a brand new one. Throughout the 80s, Bulger's power grew and his operations expanded throughout all of eastern Massachusetts. He routinely engaged in extortion, loan sharking, bookmaking, truck hijackings, and even arms trafficking. While state and federal agencies fiercely pursued Bulger and his associates, Bulger's fear of wiretappings made it difficult to obtain good intel on their operations, as he was very careful to never discuss business over a phone or inside a vehicle that could have potentially been bugged. South Boston's strict code of silence amongst its criminals also protected Bulger and his operations, the fear of being executed as a rat far greater than the fear of law enforcement. However, it was corrupt police and FBI contacts that Bulger had cultivated that ultimately made him almost untouchable, with his own FBI handler, Special Agent John Connolly, helping keep Bulger out of the sights of law enforcement. Yet Bulger would go on to say that even more important than Connolly was Massachusetts State Police Lieutenant Richard J. Schneiderhan, who constantly tipped Bulger off on investigations and possible raids. While loan sharking, theft, and extortion were Bulger's favorite crimes, the mid-1980s saw him expand into the drug trade. At first, Bulger would summon drug dealers to meet with him, and there he would reveal that he had been offered a substantial sum of money for their murder. This was a ruse, of course, but the scared dealers would happily pay a large amount of money for their life. Eventually, though, as America's love with illegal drugs deepened and profits grew to incredible levels, Bulger made his move to enter the drug trade himself. At the time, most of South Boston's drugs were under the control of a crew led by mobster John Shea, and Bulger briefly considered simply killing Shea and taking over the operation himself. Instead, though, he decided to rule from afar by extorting Shea's operation and taking a cut of his weekly profits while enforcing his own rules on the entire drug trade. Bulger strictly enforced that any dealers operating in South Boston would not sell PCP, likely due to his own experiences with the CIA's mind-affecting substances, and that they were not to sell to children. Any drug dealer not operating under Bulger's rules would be very violently driven from the town as South Boston came to be known. Bulger also frequently engaged in arms trafficking in support of the IRA during the Troubles in the 1990s, where the Irish violently opposed the British occupation of North Ireland. A lifelong supporter, Bulger made it clear to the FBI that he would never betray the IRA, and he routinely shipped weapons and blocks of C4 to the revolutionary organization. 
On at least one of those shipments, though, IRA members mistakenly burned down the van that contained a whole shipment of donated weapons and explosives. During a trip to Ireland, the crew member aboard the freighter shipping some of Bolger's donated weapons was arrested by the FBI. This crew member implicated Bolger in the shipment, though Bolger's FBI handler John Connolly overheard the implication. Shortly after, the crew member was discovered dead, murdered by Bolger. Initially not wanting to murder the crew member, though, Bolger had planned to send him to South America with money and the understanding that he was to never contact his family and friends ever again. During the course of his interrogation, though, Bolger decided that the crew member lacked the discipline to cut ties with everyone in his life and decided to murder him instead. Bolger's crime spree would come to an end in 1994, when an investigation launched by the DEA, Massachusetts State Police, and the Boston Police Department was aimed at Bolger and his operations. Knowing that the FBI had been compromised, the agency was never informed. Bolger would go on to flee Boston and stay on the run for an incredible 16 years, having spent 12 of those years at the number two spot on the FBI's most wanted list, just under Osama bin Laden. Shortly after his capture, James Joseph Whitey Bulger would be murdered in prison at the behest of the Mafia, the killing carried out by a contract killer on a life sentence and a second associate. After a life of ruling over East Massachusetts' criminal underworld, Whitey Bulger was ultimately beaten to death in a jail cell. After hearing all this, do you think crime ever truly pays? Is it worth all the money to spend your entire life looking over your shoulder? Also, be sure to check out our other video, America's Most Evil Serial Killer, Ted Bundy. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.